Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. This is a Culture of Chemistry episode focusing on idea generation and project management. My hope is that this talk might give a kind of playbook for how to approach these topics, which aren't normally covered in any kind of graduate school curriculum, and often we're expected to learn these things as we go. So the two main themes I want to talk about today are idea generation and project management. Within the topic of idea generation, I want to try to address the question of where new ideas and organic synthesis come from. Then I'll talk about some strategies for generating a chemistry idea. While this won't be comprehensive, I'll give some anecdotes from my own research career and hopefully they can be helpful. After that, I want to give a short overview of how I think a methodology project should be advanced. In this context, I'll go a little bit into how to organize data and manage a project more generally. So to get the ball rolling, I think it's worth pointing out a few general considerations about chemistry ideas in the context of research groups. Especially if you're about to join a research group or have recently joined one, we have to remember that every research group is different. Furthermore, new research groups often have very different dynamics from well-established research groups. In new research groups, the students often rely heavily on the supervisor for ideas. As the supervisor's areas of expertise are one of the group's main advantages in getting a new research line going. I think it's common for a new research group to have a few ongoing projects that are headed for publication, but suffer some kind of difficulties due to not having more experienced students in the group. However, one of the unique benefits of joining a new or newish group is that you may get a lot of direct guidance from the boss, which can be a good thing if you're new to the field. In this type of group, some important guiding questions to ask yourself include, where are the frontiers in this field or subfield? This is something that may be more obvious in a larger research group, where the experienced group members can easily say, these types of transformations have been studied a lot before, but this area of the field hasn't received that much attention. In a new research group, you may need to invest extra time in answering that question thoroughly. Another question to ask is, what kind of project could I potentially succeed with? That is, should I be working on something completely new, or should I be working on something more closely related to what's already known at first? Of course, choosing a project that's a sure thing is not necessarily the best way to guarantee a high-impact publication, so you may have to decide whether to take a risk and work in an unexplored area, rather than choose a more stable path that has less potential to lead to high-impact papers. A related question is, should I start a new project or join an existing one? If you don't have that much experience at the beginning of a master's or doctoral research program, it can definitely be worth it to play a support role in an ongoing research project before trying to do something more independent. Of course, that's a question that's important to talk with your supervisor about. In a more established research group, there may be multiple research lines that the group has pursued at different times, and that can provide a kind of in-house knowledge about one or more specific areas of the field. That knowledge can be taken advantage of as you look to develop your own projects in a group like this, although it can sometimes also be more difficult to be original when there's so much that's already been established. In this context, an important guiding question may be, is the group in the process of exploiting a research theme, or is it transitioning to a new one? And here I would emphasize that there are advantages to working either in a well-established theme or in a new one. For example, it may pave the way for a more stable research career if you choose to work in an area where the group already has established some expertise, but it's also clearly a big plus if you can get a new research line off the ground. If you're thinking about working in a well-established research territory, it's worth asking how many more high-impact projects can be created from existing themes? If the answer is not that many, maybe it's a sign that the group is entering a transition period and needs to pivot to a fresh theme. Conversely, if there's still significant territory left to explore in a research line, it's a good idea to ask, how can I take advantage of the group's expertise, knowledge, and capabilities? In this situation, those things are the main advantage that you have over potential competitors who may be aware of the group's published work. Something else I've noticed about ideas in chemistry is that they can have a kind of gravity. When new students and postdocs enter a group, they can feel the gravity of the ideas already in the group. The existing lines of research almost pull them in. The researchers are drawn to the research theme already being developed and exploited because they expect that when they invest their time in developing and exploiting that research theme, they'll be able to get papers, grants, acquire skills, and advance in their career. However, the researchers also have another option, which is to not be pulled into the gravity well of an existing theme, but rather to invest time in discovery and exploration. In this way, with luck, they can develop a new research theme. With time, that new research theme can be expanded and grow to have its own gravity, pulling in researchers who want to explore all the things that might be possible in that new research theme. With this view of idea development, some important things to think about are the relative benefits of exploiting an existing theme versus exploring a new one. Additionally, as one weighs those benefits, the researcher has to ask themselves, do I have the experience to get a new research area off the ground? Of course, you'll never know if you don't try. 
and every flourishing line of research was once just an idea in someone's head. We also have to try to realize if it's really possible to continue exploiting an existing research theme, or if the returns to time investment have diminished too much. In this case, there can be a mandate to investigate new themes that can be expanded upon. Another important consideration about chemistry ideas in the context of established research groups is that these groups can often be compared to icebergs. While we have some idea of what's going on in the group from the work they publish in the literature, there's often much unpublished work that we don't see from the outside. There are some clear advantages that a group gains by publishing its work, including allowing the field to benefit from the advance, providing additional opportunities for career development for the students and postdocs involved, and supporting future grant applications. However, group leaders or researchers may also be wary of the possibility that once the work is out there, there may be competition from other groups which could lead to scooping on related projects. On the other hand, the main advantage that unpublished work provides to a group is that it allows the group to have some additional in-house information that's not available to potential competitors. However, it's always important to remember the disadvantages to keeping work unpublished, which include the fact that researchers cannot benefit nearly as much from unpublished work, and there can also be added psychological pressure on researchers who are not able to publish as much as they think they need to. All of these considerations make a group leader's job harder and can influence group dynamics, so a group leader has to be very careful when navigating these decisions. Focusing on the perspective of the researcher now, I want to transition to talking about strategies for idea generation. The first strategy we're going to call extension of an established concept. First, let's see how this process is normally working. The researcher starts by surveying existing methods for a transformation, and that involves looking deeply into the literature and also learning about any related ongoing projects within the research group. Then the researcher starts studying new variables that haven't been looked at yet. This allows the researcher to reach more diverse products than could previously be accessed, often by changing the nucleophile or the electrophile or the coupling partners involved in the transformation or the researcher may discover by changing one of the substrate variables that it's possible to reach new valuable natural product or drug targets. To show what this type of process looks like in practice, I'll go through one example of how this idea generation strategy has played out in my own career. First I want to take a look at the established concept that the project was based on, and then we can see how it was extended. This is a reaction between hydroxyphosphonates and aldehydes, which in the presence of potassium terbutoxide can lead to the formation of the product type shown. In an asymmetric variant, this chiral superbase organocatalyst, which was pioneered by the OE group in Nagoya, Japan, could be used to access enantio-enriched 1,2-hydroxyphosphate products. This reaction is proceeding by an initial deprotonation of the hydroxy group in the starting material, which triggers a phosphor book rearrangement to generate an enolate. The enolate can then undergo an aldol addition, which is followed by a phosphate group migration, which in the case of the chiral organocatalyst leads to an enantio-enriched product. A year after this collaborative project between the OE group in Nagoya and the Johnson group at UNC was published, I started doing my own doctoral work and soon found myself working in this area. Now I want to pivot to see how this idea could be extended in a more complex system. Specifically, we started to wonder if it might be possible to apply the fundamental steps from that established work to allow a unique approach to the reductive coupling of carbonyl reaction partners. Normally, we think about that type of transformation occurring through a one-electron reduction of the carbonyls to produce ketyl radicals that lead to carbon-carbon bond formation, for example in the pinnacle coupling reaction. We wanted to see if it might be possible to take a distinct two-electron approach to this bond formation, relying on the coupling of a carbanion or enolate with an appropriate electrophile bearing a partial positive charge. We thought that maybe taking the latter approach might allow the reaction to be performed stereoselectively, using the fundamental steps developed in the established work we just looked at. As a mechanistic proposal for how we wanted to reduce this idea to practice, we imagined that deprotonation of a dialkyl phosphate with the chiral Bronsted basic organocatalyst would lead to the generation of a dialkyl phosphate anion, which could act as a nucleophile with a carbonyl electrophile to initiate a Podovic phosphobrook sequence. That would result in a carbanion or enolate, depending on the identity of the substituents, which may attack a second carbonyl reaction partner to result in a carbon carbon bond formation after which a phosphate migration would allow the phosphate to move into the least sterically encumbered position possible, and a protonation of the resulting alkoxide would produce the product shown and regenerate the catalyst. The first case that we were able to materialize this idea in was the reductive coupling of isotins and aldehydes. With that advance, we had successfully extended the initial established concept to build up the framework for a three-component reductive coupling reaction. We subsequently extended this concept further by replacing the isotin with a benzylidine pyruvate, although in that case we relied on a different chiral bronsted based organocatalyst for the asymmetric reaction. These are some examples of the types of products that could be reached through that process. 
So hopefully seeing these developments, it's a little bit more clear how it's possible to incrementally introduce new variables to a system and continue to generate new ideas that advance the frontier along the way. And now I want to talk about another related strategy for idea generation, which I would call abstraction and re-implementation. And this starts the same way as the last strategy, by surveying existing methods for a process of interest. As the researcher is looking at reports in the literature, as well as ongoing projects within the research group, they're trying to abstract from that information a generalized understanding of the process, potentially using generalized representations of the components of the reaction. By recognizing general features of the process, sometimes we can realize new contexts where those ideas can be applied in new ways. Then, by re-implementing the generalized understanding in a new system, we can often find new ways to take advantage of the same idea. I'll try now to give an example of how this idea generation can work in practice. I'll start by showing the foundational work that led to the abstraction and re-implementation. This is a reaction between a paraquinol and an enal under secondary amine catalysis which led to the cyclized product shown. This reaction occurred by an initial asymmetric conjugate addition, or oxymichael, which set one stereocenter, followed by a second conjugate addition between the enamine and the cyclohexadienone. In that second step, the potential sites where the conjugate addition can occur are diastereotopic, meaning that step is a diastereotopic group discrimination, which we've also previously called a local desymmetrization. In this case, that step results in setting three stereocenters. If all that we see is that a tetrahydrofuran was formed, or a secondary amine catalyst was used to allow an asymmetric conjugate addition, I think that we miss the key design feature that the project used to quickly build up stereochemical complexity. And that key design feature is the connection between a catalytic asymmetric step that sets some initial stereocenter or stereocenters and follows that up with the diastereotopic group discrimination to set further stereocenters. Recognizing that pattern allows us to abstract a generalized understanding of this process. When I started to look at how to apply that generalized understanding myself, I ended up arriving at this system, which at first looks completely unrelated. We're not using a paraquinol, we're not using an enol, and the catalyst is not a secondary amine, but rather a triaryl aminophosphorane, a bronsted based organocatalyst. In this case, we're using the chiral organocatalyst to deprotonate a nitroalkane and carry out an asymmetric conjugate addition to an enone diester. The ditributyl ester moiety present in the product can then be transformed into a dimethyl ester using TFA followed by TMS diazomethane. Then, the nitro group can be reduced with rainy nickel and hydrogen to result in the simultaneous conversion of the nitro group to the amine and lactamization to give the product shown. While this system bears little resemblance to the system we looked at before, we can realize on closer inspection that this is also an asymmetric conjugate addition followed by a diastereotopic group discrimination. In this case, the diastereotopic groups are the esters of the malonate substructure. Realizing that there is this general pattern, you can see how this approach to idea generation can really lead to a lot of different potential endpoints. So once you have an idea working, what happens next? To advance a methodology project, there are generally three main tasks, substrate synthesis, catalyst synthesis, and reaction trials. For example, in the last project we saw, substrate synthesis would involve making a lot of the parent substrate, the enone diester, and finding a way to make lots of derivatives. In that vein, the central guiding question is, what substrates can work in the reaction, and how can they be synthesized? And depending on how complex the substrates are, that may not be an easy question to answer quickly, so it's important to have substrate synthesis going on in the background while you also work on the other synthetic tasks. For catalyst synthesis, which in the last project we saw would be targeting structures like this, the key guiding questions are, what are the major and minor catalyst variables, as well as, how can they be optimized? For those questions, it may be possible to understand from prior work in the literature what types of changes in the catalyst structure have led to the largest changes in yield and stereoselectivity. Then you can start to prioritize what catalyst variants need to be made first, and using the reaction trials, you can evaluate them. In the previous project we saw, reaction trials would be run in this system using the latest catalyst and substrates that have been made in order to optimize the reaction and understand how big the scope can be. In that way, the results of the trials also allow you to change your plans if necessary with respect to substrate synthesis and catalyst synthesis. When we think about how to organize a methodology project, we need to identify a parent reaction and use that to evaluate our reaction outcomes, placing our data in an optimization table. As we said before, the results and trends we see inform our decisions about what new catalysts and substrates to make. Once we arrive at the optimized conditions, which I've basically glossed over, even though that's a process that can take months or even years, we usually try to see how broad we can stretch each component of the reaction in order to make the products that are accessible through the reaction as diverse as possible. 
When we're studying the scope of the reaction, it's important to keep track of what data has been collected, either in an electronic or paper spreadsheet normally. In that way, we always know what data is missing, and if you have a few spare minutes here and there, you can always devote that time to filling in the gaps. Importantly, we also need to be tabulating the data regularly, making sure that it gets entered into the supporting information in a high-quality, publishable format. After the scope is done, or even while it's going on, we often try to carry out examples of the method on gram scale and derivatize the products to targets of interest. So hopefully that can provide a useful overview of how methodology projects can be executed, starting from the formulation of the idea to advancing the project and organizing the data. And that'll wrap it up for today. Thank you for joining us for this Culture of Chemistry episode. If you enjoyed it, please support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.